how to care for it, how to load it, how to fire it accurately. And you can do a good job of hitting a target when you zero in on it. With know-how and enough practice, you may even qualify as expert. But what kind of a target will you be? Will you be easy to draw a bead on? Ignorant of how you look to an enemy on the ground? Or to an enemy observer overhead? Or will you be hard to find and harder to shoot at? Will you be skillfully blended into the terrain, using your knowledge of camouflage for your own defense and for the better security of your unit? The choice is yours, to be seen, to be vulnerable to enemy fire, or to be almost invisible, gaining the advantage of surprise in both attack and defense. Seeing is not the same as recognizing and an enemy will spend ammunition only on a target he can recognize. There are six factors which help us recognize what we are seeing. Because the eye is quick to detect motion in an otherwise still scene, movement is the most revealing of all the factors of recognition. second factor in recognition is position, the relation of an object or person to its background. Isolated figures are more recognizable than those which are blended into the surroundings. The third factor is shape, which is the form or outline characteristic of a person or object either from the ground or from the air. Shape often gives the first clue. For instance, any rectangular object is man-made and deserves a closer look. Shadow, the next factor of recognition, often provides positive identification. Sometimes shadow alone can reveal a person who is otherwise well out of view. Texture, the next factor, is used to describe the characteristics of a surface. One texture differs from another because of its ability to reflect light. Tall grass, for instance, always looks darker because each blade casts its own shadow upon itself and its surroundings. That's why it's easy to see a path that has been followed through trampled grass. Smooth objects such as this helmet change from dark to light with a change in the angle of viewing or lighting. By adding a rough textured cover, the helmet no longer reflects light. The last factor of recognition is color. Especially when a color contrasts with its background, it is an aid to identifying an object or person. One important aspect of color is tone. Objects of the same color may possess that color in different degrees of intensity. What's more, as we have seen with the helmet and tall grass, the object's texture may greatly affect the tone of its color. These then are the factors of recognition movement, position, shape, shadow, texture, and color. Camouflage is a manipulation of these factors. For instance, here is a squad. It moves like a squad and has all the qualities of a squad, position, shape, shadow, texture, and color. This is also a squad, but it no longer looks like one. 
all the factors of recognition which might otherwise identify it as a squad have been minimized. This squad is no longer an easy target, and its ability to execute its mission has been greatly increased by the fact of its near invisibility. One of the devices which has been used to affect this camouflage is dispersion. Dispersion breaks up recognizable patterns. It may seem safer to be close to a buddy, but this is how it looks to the enemy. That's quite a large target, isn't it? The enemy could easily figure if he doesn't get one, he's sure to get the other. That's better. Now neither of them can be seen too well. Disperse, don't bunch up. What feels safer is actually far more dangerous. As you disperse, remember the next rule of camouflage. Make maximum use of the natural terrain for concealment. Sometimes you can hide completely behind a shrub, a log. Or a rock. Sometimes complete concealment is impossible. When such is the case, hide as much of yourself as possible. Present the smallest target you can to enemy fire. And when it is necessary to use a hiding place like this as an observation point, try not to look over it. Doing so will just make your position obvious. It's much better to keep low to the ground. Look around the side. Even when you're behind a hedge or in the tangled undergrowth of a jungle, it is usually possible to find a vantage point or opening near the ground. That way you're not nearly as noticeable or recognizable. But sometimes you are presented with the problem of moving through open fields with the minimum of hiding places. What to do? The shortest route is right across the open field, but that's the most dangerous because it exposes you to possible enemy fire. So plan the route that affords you the most cover, even if it's a good deal longer. Once you're out of the woods, you won't have a chance to think about it. You've got to figure it out now. Where's the sun coming from? Where will the shadow fall on a pile of logs? A group of rocks? Or a clump of bushes? What is the most likely direction from which the enemy fire might come? Based on all these calculations, choose your route. Move swiftly but carefully from point to point until your objective is attained. Take care to avoid individual landmarks such as single trees, sheds or towers, narrow defiles, or haystacks for which enemy gunnery may have the exact range. Hiding is an essential technique. But the most flexible and most useful is blending. A soldier who knows how to blend himself into the terrain can achieve near invisibility in open terrain. In forests, or jungle underbrush, even in barren desert, or snow. This is a soldier preparing for combat in terrain where there is considerable foliage. He knows that a camouflaged uniform affords him a measure of protection. But what about the helmet? Something must be done to break up the line of the brim which outlines the forehead and cheeks, and the metal may need dulling down. Though the issue helmet is a dull olive drab, 
Through use, it becomes smooth and is capable of reflecting light, which can act like a beacon light, visible from a great distance. For this reason, the use of a helmet cover in combat situations is essential. If issue helmet covers are not available, an expedient is simple to make from some burlap or other coarse weave cloth. Cut a circular piece 20 inches in diameter. Pull a string through the burlap one inch from the edge. Then pull the cover loosely onto the helmet. Don't try for a close fit. A loose cover breaks up the lines of the helmet for better protection. The helmet may also be painted or smeared with mud to break up the continuous tone of the burlap. Slits and cuts are made in the cover to allow for the insertion of foliage or artificial garnish. Whether natural foliage or artificial garnish of burlap tape is used, it must be applied so as to break up the identifying outline and shadow of the helmet. Use whatever materials are available. If you expect to be in brush or a wooded area, the helmet should be garnished with fresh leaves held by a rubber band or twine. Sometimes the only possible camouflage is disruptive pattern painting. Under snowy conditions, the helmet may be painted all white. Whatever method is used to secure natural foliage to the helmet, it is essential that it always be kept fresh. Wilted foliage affords little camouflage protection. The next important step is to camouflage your face and hands. All complexions, regardless of basic skin tone, require protective coloring. Face paint for this purpose is issued in the form of sticks, each of which contains two contrasting colors. Light green and loam for white complexions. Light green and sand for brown or dark complexions. and white and loam for all troops operating in snowy terrain. Since one of the objects of facial camouflage is to distort the normal contours of the face beyond instant recognition, it is important to tone down the naturally highlighted areas, such as cheekbones, nose, and chin. The paint is applied to the face and neck, making sure that all exposed skin is adequately covered. Then the hands and arms, if uncovered, receive the same toning down. If face paint is not available, expedients such as burnt cork or lamp black should be used. Crankcase oil or grease, however, should not be applied to the face because it reflects too much light. Remember, without facial camouflage, you present an obvious and vulnerable target. But with proper facial camouflage, your chances of remaining unseen multiply enormously. The spit and polish of an inspection parade has no place in modern combat. When camouflage uniforms are not available or uniforms are bleached by sun and usage, they must be toned down. This is done by the application of dye. Camouflage paint. Soot. 
or burlap garland strips. Metal equipment also needs care. Knives or bayonets, even if originally issued in a camouflage color, tend to become shiny with use. They should be toned down with mud. Special precautions should be taken to be sure that your mess kit and canteen are not allowed to shine in direct sunlight. If you can see the shine, so can the enemy. Remember that the shape of your weapon is well known to all enemy forces, so it must be disguised. The easiest and best way is to wrap it with burlap tape, toning down any metallic parts that have become shiny. Shoulder patches have no place in combat. Neither do bright insignia and medals. Or high visibility name tapes. And that white V of a clean t-shirt can be seen at a distance. Get rid of it. Dye it OD or keep it covered. with completely camouflaged uniform, helmet, exposed skin, equipment and weapon, you need but one further preparation. An informed and constant awareness of the need for camouflage. You must know that the enemy is always trying to see you. You must continuously bear in mind that your presence can be detected not only by direct observation, but by indirect methods such as aerial photography. Aerial photography enables the enemy to see many things which cannot be seen from the ground. Places of concealment such as defilades and ditches, for instance, show up clearly from the air unless the need for camouflage protection from aerial observation has been recognized and provided for. One of the prime purposes of aerial photography is to detect changes in the appearance of the terrain by comparison of successive pictures of the same area. In this manner, it is easy to see where tracks have been worn or where trees have been chopped down. Don't make your presence obvious to enemy aerial reconnaissance. Cover spoil with bushy vegetation, sandbags, or tarpaulins. Freshly turned earth is usually brighter than its surroundings. Don't take all the branches you need for natural foliage camouflage from one tree. It's easy to spot major alterations in the landscape from the air. Avoid making new paths when walking or driving. From the air, a new path is like a large arrow pointing out your place of concealment. It doesn't take long before it's dangerously noticeable. This awareness of the need for constant care in matters of camouflage is called discipline. When you break camouflage discipline, you put your whole unit in danger. The enemy knows that if he can see or hear you, there are others nearby. Camouflage discipline is particularly important at night when both sound and light are most noticeable. The light from a single match is like a small flashlight at night. Even the glow from a lighted cigarette may be detected. Moreover, after exposure to match light or flashlight, it takes 30 minutes for your own eyes to regain their night vision. Noises seem magnified at night. Such noises as snoring, even loud whispering, or the crackle of branches underfoot can give you away. Nighttime aggravates the problem of silhouette. It is altogether too easy to forget in the dark 
the perils of showing oneself on the skyline. The rules are the same as in daytime. The position of the enemy observer, not the topographical crest, determines the skyline. Keep low to the ground. Blend in as much as possible with whatever irregular objects can be found on the skyline. Just don't forget that you can show a silhouette in certain instances even if the enemy is above you. At night, your silhouette shows black against the skyline, a clear and inviting target. That's better. Putting all the principles and techniques of individual camouflage in practice, you strive always to be aware of the surrounding terrain. What opportunities does it present for both hiding and blending? How distinctly will your shape appear in relation to the trees, fences, buildings, or other objects through which you will be advancing? What about the color of your uniform and its texture? Will they afford you protection, or will they stand out in violent contrast to your surroundings? Where is the sun or the moon? What shadows will they throw? Or what silhouettes will they reveal? Is anything you are wearing or carrying shiny? Belt buckles, jewelry, mess gear. What about your weapon? What about sound? Can you move silently? Or will every move echo with breaking underbrush and clanking gear? How about your skin tone? Do you know how to use face paint to dull the highlights around the cheekbones, nose, chin, and neck? Are you able to cover all the exposed flesh carefully on the hands and arms? Do you realize the importance of garnishing your helmet so as to break up the characteristic shape which identifies you to the enemy? Do you know how to make and maintain a helmet cover? Do you know how essential it is to plan your route even in a one-man mission, taking advantage of all the natural cover available rather than using the obvious shortcut across the terrain? Do you constantly bear in mind the techniques the enemy has for discovering your presence by direct observation or aerial photography? so that you can outwit him by strict observance of camouflage discipline. If you have the right answers to all of these questions, you'll be a valuable member of your unit. You will be able to achieve any mission of defense or offense with the advantage of surprise. An enemy who does not know for sure where you are soon thinks and acts as if you are everywhere. This puts the odds in your favor. Your knowledge of camouflage and the way you employ it may well spell the difference between victory or defeat.